Now, welcome to DC Startup Week. We apologize for having some technical difficulties there of getting in, but we're so excited. We made it work and we have Ali here today from Vidic talking to us about how to build your reputation from the ground up. So thank you so much, Ali, for being here and participating with DC Startup Week. So please join me in welcoming Ali to the DC Startup Week stage. Hey, all right, Rachel, you can still hear me okay? Good, okay. Then I'm gonna share my screen and we can get started. Um, apologies, everybody, for the chaos. Uh, but that is part of it. So, hang on. All right. All right. And I think everybody is looking at what I'm looking at. So I'm going to pop this up. And with that. And okay, here we go. All right. So <laughs> how to build a reputation from the roundup. Um, probably don't make 20 people make people wait 20 minutes to get into your talk, but uh, we'll just we'll just move forward and make the best of it. Um, so hey everybody, my name is Ali. Uh, I'm a creative director at an agency called Vigit. So uh, Vigit is a little bit of an unusual name. Um, we actually created an online video game called Say Vigit. If if you'd like to figure out how to say that where you can collect points and get uh, uh, get some coinage um, from learning how to say a Latin name, but it means thrive apparently. But um, we're a digital innovation agency. So um, that means that we are strategists and engineers and designers and with kind of an overall goal of humanizing the digital world as much as we can. So um, this is us, um, and we have offices in um, outside of DC in Falls Church in Durham, North Carolina, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and also now in Chattanooga. And that's uh, I work at the out of the DC office. But um, a long time ago, so in a galaxy far far away, I worked out of this place. So you may know the skyline. This is uh, the city of Pittsburgh. And right after I finished school, I, with a art director partner of mine, um, went to this old renovated ice house on the river in Pittsburgh and started a design interactive agency. We were both 23, we were gonna take over the world. So I, I, I feel like I have some feels around the startup um, emotions and whirlwind and what all of that feels like. And of course, we were a branding and advertising agency, so we were very focused on branding and had some big ideas about the type of image and the type of reputation we wanted to create. Um, but that was that was us, um, and that was that was sort of our job in the first place. And so I, I think it's an interesting question to think about: what if that is not you, and if you are not an ad agency that specializes specializes in branding, um, how do you start building your reputation, or is that just uh, is that just hopeless, and you have to leave it to the professionals? Uh, I of course think the answer is no. Um, I think it doesn't have to be super complicated. I think the first step is figuring out how reputation, branding, and marketing work. Um, it's coming up with then a plan to make them work for you and then sticking to your plan. So uh, unsurprisingly, agenda is going to look a little bit like that. It's going to be how reputation, branding, and marketing work, um, how to make them work for you, and then uh, consistency, which is the secret but unbelievably bland sauce of, of a lot of branding. Um, from my point of view. So first, kind of a crash course in how reputation, branding, and marketing work. So I want you to just close your eyes for a second and, and picture a car gently rolling down, like a not particularly steep hill. So that car is going to be propelled forward, even if your hands are off the wheel and your foot's off the gas. It's, it's an object in motion, whether you're in control of its speed and direction. 
Um, similarly, if uh, your reputation is also a object that is in motion, um, so whether or not you're making any proactive efforts to direct its course. So if you think about reputation kind of as like that car. So every business has reputation, um, even if no one's ever heard of you, that just means that you have the reputation of being somebody nobody has ever heard of. But not everyone is proactively working to steer that reputation in the direction they'd like to go. So how do you do that? You do it through your brand. So I know branding is a notoriously slippery subject. Uh, what, what is your brand? Is it your logo? Is it your design aesthetic? Your mission statement or value prop? Uh, one, rep one definition I hear often is your brand is what people think about when they hear your organization's name. I think that it sounds nice, but I actually think that might not be true. Um, I think that the thing that people are thinking about when they hear your reputation, uh, when, they, when, when, when they hear your organization's name is your brand, it's not your reputation. And your brand is actually a tool that you can use to steer that reputation in a specific direction. So it can also help you point your reputation um, out of danger when um, it's facing some potential road hazards because of market conditions changing or because of something happening uh, either that you did or didn't have control of. And so I think an interesting example of that is uh, Chipotle. Everybody's probably familiar with Chipotle. They have a brand that's called Food with Integrity. You know, it's their brand because they trademarked it. But in the example of sort of a market or road condition that they ran into and started causing them some issues was a massive E. coli breakout in 2015. You may or may not remember this. And it, it went on for several years and it just battered their stock. And so you, you could say that, well, that's super embarrassing. Um, that's a problem to have a, a brand that's all about food with integrity and, and people are getting sick. But what's interesting is that they use that brand to help them navigate out of that sort of equalized sinkhole um, in a really effective way. And so, so this is what we what we're, mean when we're talking about brand being that steering wheel to help you move around and actually purposefully direct your reputation no matter what's happening around you. So they publicly took responsibility for their mistakes. Even on their website still, they have huge um, food safety sections where they where explain all of the work that they do to, to keep the food safe and keep people safe. Um, they paid an epic $25 million fine, um, which, which never hurts. It's uh, principle is not a principle until it costs you money. And then they also stuck to their brand. They didn't dial it back and try and re rebuild or try and become something else. Uh, they, they, they focused um, on their dedication to fresh ingredients and they use that as the way to get back on track and in 2018 they launched this as real as it gets campaign which can easily be tied back to the food with integrity concept and in addition to highlighting ingredient transparency the campaign introduced messaging that really uh, broke through with endearing honesty and um, authenticity so the, the point there is that having a quality brand strategy in place makes it easier to proactively plot a course to the reputation you want to create and it also helps you react quickly and effectively to sort of unforeseen road conditions along the way. So if your reputation is a vehicle and your brand is the wheel, where does marketing fit in? So I think it's interesting to think about marketing as the gas and the idea is that the harder you sort of slam down on that pedal, the faster your reputation can reach that desired destination. So what does that actually look like in real life? So someone who is, you know, just flooring it from a marketing perspective is Spotify. Um, they have a brand strategy in place um, that is, is pretty, pretty interesting and really effective. So, um, and they use a variety of executions and tones to leverage that strategy. Um, and they do that everywhere from, um, you know, the product itself to billboards, um, end of year marketing, and it, it leverages meme culture, um, all in an effort to capture that moment when this is kind of the, the strategy that, that Collins talks about. So they say um, 
the strategy emerged directly from the platform when an individual makes a personal connection with the song their reaction is to cry or cheer or scream sing jump get chills or as we phrased it burst with emotion our identity graphically captured that moment so this the brand is all about this moment when you have this emotional reaction to a song. And so you can see then the implementation of that through their marketing, the, the sort of gas that they put behind that is a really great, I mean, this is just one of them, a uh, great marketing campaign that you have seen probably lots of places. Also kind of the year end roundup. Um, it's very consistent. It's, it's joyful. Um, it's hilarious. And it, I don't know if you can, you know, just connect the dots, dot to dot to dot, to say this is why they're the most successful streaming music platform. But you can see that as far as premium subscribers, they are are doing doing well. And I think having a a great reputation that is calibrated through brand and given gas through awesome consistent marketing is a part of that. So um, I think the, the, the takeaway there is that if you're not investing in smart on-brand marketing execution, so the gas for your reputational car, it really doesn't matter how great your brand is um, because without any gas in the tank, you end up on the side of the road sort of frankly spinning the wheel uh, going absolutely nowhere. So uh, if your marketing is the gas, um, your brand is the wheel and your sort of cars as general reputation. That is great, wonderful sort of theoretic concept for reputation and branding, but what does that actually mean for you if you're starting out in a business and you wanna be intentional about the type of reputation that you're building? Um, so I think this is really interesting and also not overly complicated. It takes a little, little bit of um, elbow grease, I guess, I don't know if that applies, mental grease, I don't, I don't want to say that anymore, yeah. Uh, but so, so to talk about this, I want to sort of share a little bit of a secret. I, I love my job and I love what I do, but there is also like a secret separate dimension job that I think I'd also really like and that some days I, I think about and that's being a movie location manager. So that's the person that goes around and finds all the great spots that then people come and shoot and they work with the director to try and figure out if, if what has the right tone and what's going to help the storytelling. Like, I, I, I love that idea. I would probably be terrible at it for a lot of reasons, some of them diplomatic, but I just like, I would love to be the person who found worldwide tacos, you know, on, on Insecure or basically like the entire set of Atomic Blonde is amazing, like 80s, like someone goes out and finds those places and it's their job and it's really cool. So as an example, um, if I were starting a brand new business called Placeholder Locations Are Us, so I'm a location manager and I, I wanna start my own business, I wanna put out my shingle, um, maybe grow and have other people working with me. How would I approach doing that if I want to figure out how to do that from the ground up? So um, I think the way to do that is to plot what reputational outcomes I want to achieve. I think then think about the branding and marketing activities that will help me achieve those outcomes. And then think about the timeline. So how long is this all going to take? How do I want to track my progress? How do I want to keep myself accountable? So if you're thinking about how you could do this, I just want to demo it, how I would do it for the thriving Locations R Us startup that I'll start in some other dimension at some point. So uh, what reputation outcomes do I want to achieve? So um, I think that you can kind of even do a little chart like this for yourself and then just start from the beginning. So say, and you kind of want to think about it like a snowball, so reputation builds on itself. So um, maybe the first outcome that I want to see is pretty straightforward. You know, people see the service as something that's worthwhile and valuable. I think that's probably a good reputation outcome for any new business. Um, a second one is the service has regular customers and maybe a handful of evangelists. So you have regular business and then you have some people who are out there selling the business for you because they believe in what you do. 
maybe a third one is the service is considered legit. So, you know, people know who you are, they know the type of work that you provide and, and you're up in kind of the top five or 10 um, in the industry that people are thinking about. And maybe as a big sort of stretch goal, the service is considered the gold standard. So if somebody wants the best, they go to you because that's your reputation because you are the gold standard. So, I mean, I think this could potentially be a pretty simple reputational outcome timeline for anybody. It could be different though, and probably the more specific you get, more contoured to your business, the better, but I think these are pretty, pretty straightforward. So now that I have those reputational outcomes that I wanna to get to, um, how do I think about branding and marketing activities that will help me achieve those outcomes? Like if, if branding and marketing are working together to get me to the reputational location that I wanna to get to, um, so what should that actually look like? How should I steer? How much gas should I apply? What does that look like? So this is where you start going horizontal. So, so I have a, maybe pretty, again, lo low hanging fruit, but I have a clear personality differentiator and value proposition for my business. That's kind of just branding 101. So wanna get those things locked down. Um, and since my name is Locations RS, I need a new name. So I have a new company name and logo. I, I put the personality differentiator and value prop first, cause I think that's, how you get a great name and, and logo that you sort of have to think through that foundation first and then use that to pick a name, but not everyone does it that way. Um, and then I have marketing site that, uh, that reflects my new name and brand. So, so these, this, is, this is pretty straightforward. Those are branding efforts that are gonna help get to the outcome of people see what I do is worthwhile um, and valuable. And from a marketing standpoint, um, I think providing testimonials, that's a good goal to have. Um, I, um, I can give customers exposure to the service so that kind of like behind the scenes um, social posts. And um, I, I'm tied into PR and um, sort of media coverage. I'm, I'm getting some buzz, practically looking to get some buzz for a company I just launched or a company that's succeeding. So next, um, when you are trying to then go from just being considered worthwhile and valuable to idea of I've got a regular customer base, handful of evangelists, what does that look like? So I think a couple of branding efforts that can get you to that location are, um, you have really an established messaging style, an established voice that you're comfortable using and something that maybe if you've expanded your team, they're comfortable using. So the, the personality and voice of the business is established and repeatable. Um, and then having just achieved consistency, sort of that magic, boring, secret sauce. Um, so your design, your messaging, your customer experience, basically all of your touch points are consistent and on brand. And, and the, the value of that is a customer knows what they're gonna get when they engage with you um, and you seem established and real. And then from a marketing standpoint, um, compelling case studies. So going from testimonials to actual case studies, I think is, is a good goal to, to get to a regular customer base. And then um, being able to prove um, the value through, I mean, in this case, this industry, maybe even awards and box office. You've got some sort of tangible metrics there. Um, and then knowledge sharing, you know, th this is a time to start sharing what you know with your peers and your audience also benefits from that, even, even if it's not directly um, addressing their needs. So this is a good, a good place to be in. Um, you are profitable, you have customers, you have some really excited customers, but how do you get into that legit category? What are some of the, the efforts that can, can help then sort of level you up. So um, I, think, I think one of them is this idea of kind of like going public with that deeper organizational purpose. So yeah, I think if you've been following MailChimp, sort of their, their growth and expansion, you know, they've, they've said that they're not, they're not just about email anymore, they're about you know, authentically selling empowerment and entrepreneurism. 
So some might raise eyebrows at that, but others might say, yeah, that's, that's company vision, um, that's big picture, that's what legitimate companies do. They have a big picture vision for their role in their vertical and also even in the culture itself. So, um, and then also having brand ambassadors. So going from people that, you know, are thankfully promoting your company because they're an evangelist, they love what you do. Like this means you have people on staff who are taking care of your branding and they're on top of it. So then um, I think at this stage is when you can sort of pull on the thought leadership pants um, and, and start sort of expressing those ideas to your vertical and also to the world at large. Uh, by doing that, you emphasize that you have a right to have these opinions because you're legit. Um, and then also, I think this is a time to start trying to see if you're winning. Again, this is a big question mark of what that actually means, but a legitimate company should, should have decent SERP. Um, and when people are organically looking for this type of work, you should at least surface somehow. Um, and that should be a result, hopefully, of some of the content marketing that you've been doing through thought leadership and also um, knowledge sharing, because that's how it's supposed to work. And then lastly, so you are the gold standard. Um, you are the blank of blank. I'm not sure what the gold standard is of those things. But um, so I think that at this point, being able to articulate a unique philosophy that becomes part of the brand promise is absolutely necessary. That might happen earlier on in your reputational journey. But I think at this point, to be the gold standard, there's a way that you do things and you need to articulate that and that's part of why people engage with you um and i think at this point then expanding beyond you know thought leadership into actual engagement uh, with with your community whether that is conferences whether it's meetups whether you're doing talks whether you're doing classes um that that's what uh sort of a gold standard organization does um, and often does it for free and then from a marketing standpoint, um, it, it, it's being able to say that you really offer a truly one of a kind service that you can't get to anywhere else. So, and, and it means that you're being very opinionated about that in, your, in all of your marketing. It, to be premier, you have to have an opinion. And the gold standard is who people look to for opinions. So, um, you know, nobody's going to ask that of you in sort of that first column, but I, but I think at that point, you really, you need to be able to have a, an opinion that this is the way things should be done. Um, and kind of lastly, again, this is in the last sort of corner, but, but having for this type of a business, sub brands don't make sense, but I think what you could say is that a sub brand is that you can offer kind of like a couture approach to individual customers that they can't get anywhere else so that you have a specific style or approach that you can say, well, I'll do this on your film. Um, we're the only people that can do this type of thing. I think uh, maybe the Wes Anderson package um, comes to mind. So, um, so this is kind of like a, a roadmap, um, but how long does it take to get here? I think is a question and, and like all roadmaps, it's, subject to uh, maybe taking a wrong turn now and then. But I, again, and this is realistically just to try and keep yourself on track. I think that in this business, and it might be different for your business, but you know, about a year is probably a, a good turnaround time to say, you know, I have value, I, I am worthwhile. That gives you a couple like three month intervals of movies, time for them to come out. Um, I think that sort of being at a, a regular customer customer base and some people who've maybe worked with you more than once and can really start to evangelize what you do. I think a couple of years is, is probably realistic. I think going legit, um, you know, maybe four years, somewhere between that. And then I think when you're talking about being gold standard, and this depends on what industry you're into, but I think anywhere five to 10 years um, could be an interesting goal. So that is 
that is, I think, a way to make that work for you, um, especially if branding isn't your business and you're, you're just trying to come up with a framework that makes sense for you. And the last is just this idea of um, consistency. So it's super boring, um, but it is the secret to 67.4% of all branding um, is just being consistent. And this is something we actually talked about last year in branding for startups is this idea that you should just never not be who you are. And so if you have that, if you have that plan and you've started to set those things in place, the way that you really make it work for you is that you stick to the plan and that you stick to the decisions that you've made or you, you make changes and then you stick to the changes. And we talked a little bit about this guy. This is an example of a, someone who is never not who he is. Um, you know, De Niro, he plays one role. He plays Robert De Niro and he does it really well. And he's an incredibly strong brand and commands um, salaries that are commensurate with that. But you can also see startups who've done that well. Um, Casper is kind of a gold standard in this sense. Um, they are never not who they are, no matter whether they're doing mattresses or whether they're doing these like super, super niche um, night lights uh, and the apps for those night lights, you know, it, it is all consistent. They are never not Casper. And, and that's an important part of it. They, they stick to the plan and they, they get the plan done. But I think the other thing is to also give yourself a little room to a little forgiveness. I don't know that, that this process can be um, very uncomfortable if branding isn't your thing, particularly if um, even if you're a tech startup, uh, where sort of the the altars that you worship are you know experimentation, hypothesis, evolution, revision, and branding is about sort of the exact opposite. So legitimacy, conviction, consistency, stability. So even engaging in this type of work is um, is just going to feel weird, and you might need to give yourself a separate sort of isolated space to get in that mind frame um, so that it, it just doesn't just feel like an ill-fitting suit the whole time because it, it is important um, and the last thing is if nothing else i would even as someone who's starting a business i would recommend a book that i stumbled on in someone's garage and wiped a bunch of dust off of it and i think it I don't want to say it changed my life, but it really opened my eyes, especially as a creative. And this is what's interesting. It's not by like a creative, creative person at all. It's this book called Execution. So the discipline of getting things done. And so it's the most un like artsy, uncreative. It is not, um, you know, Creativity Inc., which is also great, but uh, this is a former CEO of General Electric, and it, it's just fascinating. Um, it, it, it just sort of changed my mind around the idea of how having great ideas is not enough. You have to be able to figure out a way to get the great ideas done. And that's not, again, something like consistency that really isn't something people talk about a lot because uh, it's kind of boring. But there's apparently only one one copy left, so maybe other people are reading it. But uh, I think it's fantastic, um, and I think I wish I had I had read it when I had started a business and understood the importance of like you just gotta get shit done, and 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 that's a big that's a big part of it. So uh, thank you, thank you for bearing bearing with me at the start, and I saw some questions flashing up there. Uh, at the corner of my eye. So, um, which I don't know if you want to sure. see that part or. Yeah, I can read some of the questions to you. So we have a question from Lionel. Any tips on how to get good PR and marketing for less when we are a startup with limited funds? Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that one, one way to do that is to do 90% of the work for whatever outlet you are trying to get um, mentioned in. People are busy and the maw of content is wide and never ending. And so I think that if you can pitch somebody a story about you and already have the outline, maybe even written a good chunk of it, um, I think that's a really great way to get people to snap up 
uh, a piece or create a piece on you because you've just made their life a lot easier. Um, I think that also trying to figure out how what you're doing fits into whatever is happening at the moment, because that's another massive pressure point that people feel is that they want to keep things fresh and relevant. Um, and then um, controversy is, is also, if you're willing to go that way, um, it, it's also a great way to, to get some attention. So um, whatever controversial looks for you, um, I think is an interesting way to do that. We have another question about when should you use social media ads and when to use word of mouth? Mm. I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that um, because my, I, I, my focus is branding and, and not marketing, but um, I don't know. I don't know if there's somebody in the comments who might have a, a, a good response to that. I, I don't, and I don't want to just fake it. Um, I, that's just not really my area, but there may be someone who has a, has a really thoughtful response to that. I'd love to, I'd love to hear it. And it's definitely some question you could put up on the activity stream and attendify and some people from the yeah. community will be able to help. One kind of follow on yeah. question is how much is too much when spending on branding materials and marketing that goes with it? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great, that is a great, a great question because it's, it is all over the place. Uh, some people will charge you $5,000. Some people will charge you a million dollars. Um, I think that, I think that you should figure out how much you can spend um, realistically with your budget. And then you should go find someone who is willing to do work of value for that amount of money. Um, and so, you know, um, look at people's portfolio, it, you know, ask for references. That stuff is important and that stuff matters. Um, references particularly are important, but, um, you know, if you're just starting out, and you know you're thinking about spending fifty thousand dollars on brand you know like that's that's crazy i would say um you probably know that already but um yeah i i i i, I also wouldn't you know just go get somebody's um you know the the child of a friend or spouse who kind of dabbles in illustrator to like crank out a logo for you because then you're stuck with it and then you have to rebrand and that's frustrating but um i would say the i would say the 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 way to do that is to figure out how much money you have and then find somebody who can do great work for that amount of money and like all all deal finding um the it, it takes it takes work but it, it's worth it. So Ali, for the last question of the day, it's from Harrison. I come at this from the people's operations and employer perspective. Would you adjust any of this to build an employer brand to guide your decisions in regard to your employees and how so? That's a good one. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I would think of sort of in the col the second column we talked about um, making sure that you have distinct voice and tone and messaging for all of your different audiences and that you know what type of value prop you're emphasizing for each of those audiences. I, I think that from your point of view, um, recruits are an audience. And so I think that whatever you're saying to the folks that you're looking to recruit needs to be aligned with whatever the business is saying overall. It might be a slightly different angle, a slightly different tone, um, a slightly different take on the value prop, but it, it, needs to, um, it needs to align with that. So, so I think first up is figuring out what the business is doing and then look at recruiting through through the angle that is appropriate and might need to tweak it a little bit.
Thank you so much, Ali, for the wonderful presentation today on how to build your reputation from the ground up. I really appreciate your time and sticking with us despite the technical difficulties that we had going on. And for all the participants, thank you so much for hanging in there for the first 20 minutes of getting the technical difficulties working. So we absolutely love that. Ali's been a good supporter of DC Startup Week. So Ali, maybe if you could share like your website or a way that people are able to reach in touch with you, like on the chat functionality. Um, so they sure. just connect. And now Ali's also in the Tendify platform. So you could private message her speaker profile there. Um, we ask if you are wanting to, you could always put some insights on the activity stream in the Tendify or also on social media. Um, a quick thing, next we have up Beyond the New Nitro Brew, a new vision for workplace culture, filling the startup sales funnel, and last, founders panel, how to get the most out of your virtual accelerator. So you can get those Zoom links right on Attendify, the web browser, or also the mobile app. So we hope to see you soon at 3 p.m. for the next session. Then tonight we're closing at 5.30 for the pitch battle competition. So we hope to see you guys there. We'll see you soon. Thank you, and thank you so much, Allie. Thanks.